So first, a huge thanks for taking some of your, um, your short lunch time to join us today. Uh, this is a really exciting time for Queen's PT program as we are getting ready to launch and embark on a, a pretty substantive curriculum change for our program. And um, that's really important to uh, the clinical community because A, there are going to be people who are our colleagues very shortly, but also because there are implications for clinical placements for, um, for the students who are coming your way. And so we just want as many opportunities, uh, opportunities as we can to um, share information about the change in the curriculum, particularly as it relates to um, what to expect in, in clinical placements. So this session, what we're gonna do today is go through, um, I'll just bring that up, there we go. Um, a quick overview of some of the changes. Hopefully all of you received uh, an email letting you know about it, changes in the curriculum coming up. And uh, those few videos that gave you uh, an overview of what some of those changes are. We're going to quickly do a high level overview of those today um, and then open the floor for questions. So if it's okay with everybody, what I'd love to do is just go to take five minutes to go through and do this quick overview of changes and then open the floor up for questions afterwards. So we'll try to get through that in, in a pretty short order to leave lots and lots of time for questions. Um, so the first thing we wanted to talk about were these, the new kind of concept for PT anyway of academic half days. So medicine has been using these embedded in their clinical rotations for quite some time, but um, it's fairly new for, for physiotherapy. And this will apply this year um, just to the first year placements because those are the cohort of students that will be enrolling where we're starting this new curriculum. And so that for those of you who know our codes for placements, we're talking about applying to PT 881 and PT 882 in the 2023-2024 academic year. So just those first two clinical placements um, in the junior level. And those are four, what that means is that students will be on clinical placement four and a half days a week. And there will be a half of a day a week where students are um, pulled from the clinical placement to participate in Queen's led sessions. What that means or what that translates to is to make sure we get the same amount of clinical contact time for our students. We're extending those placements from what originally was six weeks now into a seven week block. It's the same amount of contact time with you as a clinical instructor. The difference is that that half day a week, they're going to be doing Queens led activities. That was really instigated by at a request of students predominantly. Um, the, many of them are at clinical sites where they may be the only student and they were looking for opportunities to um, connect with each other. Um, to talk about, you know, things that were happening on clinical placements and have that opportunity as a cohort to, to have those touch points. In addition to that, when we have our senior level cohort who are doing their senior level placements, um, they're going to be having opportunities to provide some leadership to the uh, first year cohort. Um, but that won't happen in our first year of the curriculum because we don't have a second year cohort um, in this new model yet. So um, yeah, the, the biggest message for the clinical community is that with these academic half days, it means that students will be with you four and a half days a week, but spread over seven weeks. When you get information about the match of, for your offer and about that clinical placement, it will include information about which half day the student would be away from placement. So we're going to go ahead and do that matching based on feedback we received from the clinical community that that was the best approach for us to use. Um, we're going to do that matching and, and tell the clinician which half day the student will be away. But if it's something that doesn't work for you and your clinical schedule, you can contact the school and request a change to that date. So just making sure it works in your time as well. The second major change that we wanted to just review here is a change in the placement evaluation tool that we'll be using, and that will be for all clinical placements starting um, in the 2023-2024 academic year, regardless of whether it's first year students or second year students. And these new evaluation tools are called uh, PEPAs or Physiotherapy and Trustable Act Professional Activity Assessments. 
and um, and it is a change or it's a departure from what we've been doing, but we hope it's something that actually mirrors better what you're doing already in practice. And it, hopefully it feels like a really genuine evaluation of the student's performance. Um, it's very, hopefully very observable skills that you're going to be documenting about. And the intent here is that we're going to have more frequent but smaller points of evaluation throughout the placement. So instead of having a big midterm and a big final evaluation, we'll have a whole series of smaller evaluations that will be very quick for you to complete. Um, and it also allows students to get feedback early on in, in the placement as well. So there are 10 entrustable professional activities or EPAs that will be evaluated and they're very clinically relevant tasks that you can hopefully imagine yourself doing week to week as a physiotherapist. And there are things like documentation, coming up with a diagnosis and a prognosis, completing a, a comprehensive physical exam. Like, so those are the kinds of things that you would be evaluating their student on their ability to perform. Each EPA needs to be evaluated at least three times at the expected level of performance. And just like we have currently, for junior, intermediate, and senior level placements, the expectations are a little bit different in terms of how independent a student would be performing all of these activities. So when they're junior level and they're just starting out, we expect you as a clinician to need to talk them through some things and give them some feedback. But we hope as they approach senior level that they're able to do some more of those tasks um, fully independently without requiring intervention or support as much from the clinical instructor. For the most part, because we have adult learners and we're trying to use an adult learning model in our curriculum, we want students to be initiating and tracking these evaluations. Clinicians do have the opportunity to do that if they would like to initiate some of the evaluation points, but generally it's going to be the student who is the one who is triggering or initiating these assessments. And they are going to be done through the same platform we use to track our clinical placement hours. And so when you receive and uh, if you're familiar with receiving the stats that students are recording about tracking how many hours of cardio rest and how many hours of neuro they've completed, uh, we'll be using that same platform, which is called Elentra, to deliver these assessments. So very similar, you'll receive um, an email where you click on a link to complete that evaluation that the student has initiated. Our curriculum is also moving to um, a, a slight shift in how we deliver the content of our curriculum. The content itself is actually very similar. I mean, we still have the same curriculum guidelines that we had previously, but the way we're intending to deliver the curriculum is somewhat changed. And one of the main features that I think is really important and interesting for clinicians is to um, understand that we're doing uh, using a model where we're using cases as the vehicle to have a lot of the discussions about curricular content. And so uh, we have case, at least one case, and in some cases, multiple cases um, each week. And we'll be pulling out relevant information from those cases to highlight different parts of practice. And, um, and there will be a series of cases that happen in advance of each clinical placement not anticipating that anyone can even probably read the, the case names here. Um, we will, I, we did circulate this as well when we sent out our call for placement offer, offers for this year. So you can have a better look at it and see where, um, where your practice maybe fits in a little bit better. But also just recognizing just because we have a condition listed doesn't mean we're exclusively talking about that condition. We're also thinking much more broadly about communication skills, about professional practice, about research and doing, um, looking at evidence-based practice as well. All of that's integrated in, in the case information and we'll be getting, pulling that information with students and having them problem solve and work through these cases with lots of different lenses as well. So you can see there the list though, but for PT81, which case um, conditions will be covered, PT82, PT83, four and five. Um, yeah, it's really important to note too that not, the cases change, but we're also looking at um, a, kind of a shift, I would say as well. We're really not focusing on just musculoskeletal conditions at the very beginning of the program and then moving to neuro and then moving to cardio rest. It's, um, it's much more integrated and we call it a spiral curriculum because we'll be revisiting um, not the specifics of a case or a condition, but some of the principles and the approach to care and other things will be revisited multiple times across the two years of the curriculum. 
same thing with um, with settings. So uh, we'll have cases that are um, more relevant for private practice acute care rehab early in the program, and we'll revisit those settings again later in the program. And similarly with lifespan. So, um, you know, early on we'll get um, kind of a whole spectrum of lifespan and then we'll revisit conditions that um, impact people with different uh, lifespans as well, or different parts of the lifespan. Timing of placements. Um, there is a shift this year, I call it the wonky year because we are in this transition year where um, we're going from our current curriculum with our, our students that um, will be graduating next year and they're gonna maintain in their current curriculum. And then we have this new curriculum layered on top of that for the incoming students for the class of 2025. And so this coming year is a little bit unusual, but there is a change in the timing of placements with the new curriculum. So they're listed here and you'll note that seven weeks for those junior level placements. Um, and the other thing to really note about this is that uh, just as a product of having to overlay the old curriculum and new curriculum, we have one period of time, which is PT 85, April 22nd to May 31st, and 82, May 6th to June 21st. And I think pretty quickly you'll see there's overlap between those two placement blocks. And so um, it will just pose a little bit of a challenge for us this year as we go through this transition, but that um, hopefully it'll be a one-time thing where we just have to get through that this year and, and that won't be an issue again for subsequent years. Our new curriculum, really there are no periods in the year, or very few little windows in the year where there will not be students out on placement. So currently September and October are a time where we typically wouldn't have had clinical placements. The new curriculum, um, once we fully roll that out, there will be a placement block in that period. This is a very high level overview and we're going through all of this fairly quickly because we want to make sure we people have time for questions, but I did want to mention too that we will be having additional education sessions for clinicians with uh, more specifics and details, particularly around how this new evaluation tool is going to work and actually how the mechanics of it. We didn't want to do that too early on though because we recognize if you're not actually using it or putting it into practice, you probably won't remember by the time a student's coming your way. And so uh, we do have four additional sessions that we have um, planned for September and October. So you can see the dates there. Um, the first is about the new model of education, which is competency-based education. The new curriculum schedule we'll go over in a little bit more detail and academic half days. We'll follow that up with a detailed um, education session about these new physiotherapy and trustable professional activity assessments or PEPAs for placements. And then we'll repeat those two sessions again for those who weren't able to join, um, you know, people hopefully can find something that works. We'll do it again over a lunch hour and hope we can catch the most people possible. Um, and we'll be sending out the Zoom links for those, uh, those as we get closer to that September, October timeframe. So I will stop there. I know I, I lots and lots of information in a concise way. Um, and so just wanted to, uh, yeah, to introduce kind of that, the ideas of what we're talking about to layer onto the information you already received by email and the short videos. And this is really open forum now just to ask questions. Um, I see Lisa that you have a, question in the chat there, it's a comment um, and, and a, an important one. We actually just learned about this fairly recently with the change in electronic documentation um, locally. So we're, it sounds fantastic that we're gonna have many of our, our clinical sites working through with the same EMR, which I think is you know, overall like a really good idea, but it sounds like the timing of when we have our double cohort of students out on placement um, is similar to the, the time when that rollout will happen. So yeah, I mean, I, I think we all can agree that there's certainly no end of, of new things and challenges sometimes in terms of, uh, uh, you know, new innovations in healthcare and having to roll with things a lot. So that will be one thing I, I appreciate that it may pose some challenges for the clinicians as they're trying to learn that new system and also um, supervise students. But uh, we're hopeful that, um, you know, that the students can be of assistance actually during that time as well. 
And Jordan, I appreciate your message as well that even though it's a challenge having that double cohort, sometimes it's also a great opportunity to have senior students and junior students working together. And so if a clinical sites are able to offer that, it's something that there can be a little bit of mentorship happening between the two cohorts of students as well. Something we do actually don't currently have a lot of opportunity for. Um, so Brody, yeah, I see your question there about the, Brody's question is how anatomy lectures work into the new curriculum. And so do they do anatomy just specific to cases or is there still a separate and specific anatomy course? Um, so there, at the, there is no specific anatomy course. It, it's integrated into uh, the rest of the curriculum. And so it will be um, some information that's provided often in advance of a particular week where um, the students will be given information, refreshers about the anatomy that they may want to apply or need to apply for to uh, connect with that case for the week. And so it's it, they will still get anatomy information and it's certainly still built into the curriculum, but it's not a standalone course. It's actually designed so it's integrated more in an applicable way. So it's, it's anatomy, but not just thinking about anatomy in kind of in a separate context, but anatomy actually in context. Sorry, Al, I see that. I think you have your hand raised there, so feel free There's to feel unmute free to there. Unmute there. Thanks very much, Mel, for the overview. Just a couple of questions. With respect to the students doing their evaluation on the PEPAs, you were saying that there would be three touch points at some point. And on a seven week placement, would you be suggesting that we would be doing interim assessments or reassessments with them every two and a half weeks? Uh, typically, you'd be giving them their feedback at the interim, at the halfway point and on the final. So that's one question. And secondly, I was just looking at the overall curriculum and you can probably see where I'm going with this with my bias, but I was just wondering what if there were any critical care competencies that you had included in the curriculum as far as, I did see ARDS as, as one of the categories, but if you could just maybe touch base on both of those questions briefly, it'd be greatly appreciated, thanks. I'll tackle the first one. I'll maybe stop talking and let someone else tackle the I can next tackle one. the I'm second happy. one, Mel, because we sure, have sure, it. Hi, Al, nice to see you. <laughs> Yeah, so in terms of, uh, I know I gave short shrift to the, the PEPA assessments and how they're going to work. Um, so as it stands right now, many of you are familiar with the ACP, which is um, the big midterm and big final assessment that students, that you would complete to give students feedback. What we're really hoping for is that students will get smaller points of assessment peppered throughout their placement. There's no set schedule for those. Um, it's really discretionary um, based on your caseload, based on student performance, based on all sorts of variables when you want to get those done. But what it amounts to across those seven weeks, because there are 10 EPA assessments that we, we would like to get evaluated, have students be evaluated on. And we're hoping that the student demonstrates at the expected level of performance three times for each one of those, it means a, a minimum, a base minimum, 30 mini assessments. And I like to stress the word mini because when I think when most clinicians hear the word 30, they start to have heart palpitations, but they really mirror what you're already doing with students, which is giving them that day-to-day -day feedback. It's a very quick documentation of that and formalization of that feedback. And it's once you have an opportunity to get the education session, and actually see what they look like. I think you'll um, quickly see that they're they're quick to complete. They're very clinically relevant, and they're going to happen throughout the whole time of the placement. We don't need to wait till midterm to get students' feedback um, and document that feedback. And so um, you're used to the midterm and final. For this coming year, um, we are removing the midterm assessment, ACP, and so that will no longer be an expectation for clinical placements. We will be maintaining the final ACP, and the reason for that is that we are going through the process of validating the PEPA as, as tools for assessment of placement, and we do need to have that point of comparison with those final ACP assessments. 
So this is a little bit of an assessment heavy year um, for that reason, but our hope is that if these are doing their job and assessing students appropriately on their clinical placement, that eventually they can become the entirety of how students will get evaluated on placement. I hope that answered that, that, answer that question. Yes, thanks, Melanie. Appreciate it. And <clears throat> I can speak to the competency. Oh, really thanks, care. Anita. Sure. So actually, you did see that there is a specific critical care case in the year two of the program, but we will be introducing aspects related to critical care competencies very early on. So even in the week three case, our our case that week, the person is in the CVICU and we'll be introducing like factors related to how to determine if someone's ready for mobility. So right in week three of year one, they're gonna start getting introduced to things. Uh, we had planned to start um, some talk about oxygen supplementation in year one as well. Um, the safe mode tool, things like that in year one. So by the time they come to their first placement, they will have been introduced to some of those competencies. Suctioning, we are reserving to year two, which is similar to the current curriculum. Um, but I think you'll find that they will have been exposed to more topics before they come to their first placement. Great, thanks, Anita. Everyone's probably digesting all of this information, but again, feel free just to Put up your hand if you'd like to unmute and ask a question or feel free to throw it in the chat as well. I hope it's coming across. We're all really excited about this new curriculum and uh, really excited. You know, we don't just like any change. Um, there's I'm sure going to be a few hiccups along the way, but it's, you know, it's been in the works for quite a few years now. I'm pretty excited that September is going to be um, you know, launch time for this this new curriculum that we've been working on. I'm wondering, I know, uh, oh, there we go. I have, do you have another question? Okay. so. First question is, are the lunch and learns that we were just describing earlier that will happen in September and October, are they mandatory for accepting students? Um, we know the clinical, your clinical day um, is not always your own and recognize that it's very difficult sometimes to, to commit to and carve at that time. Of course, we'd love clinicians to all be present at those lunch and learns, but it's very similar to what we're doing today. We will be recording those sessions and circulating them as well. Um, just recognizing not everybody will be able to attend those. Um, so the, although not um, mandatory to attend those events, we're very hopeful that all clinicians before they accept a student would, um, if they didn't attend, would at least be able to view those um, before the student comes. We'll send those out with placement um, match information again as well. So just there's going to be lots of opportunities to review those. And we're just hopeful that in some way, whether it's the, the first iteration of it, or watching um, after the fact, we're hopeful that, that clinicians will all be able to view that in some way before the student comes on site. Mel, there's just another question there um, from Bernie. Um, mm -hmm. With the students initiating the assessments, what if they pick the easy clients, if you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> we do know <laughs> what you mean. And I think part of the reason we have the capacity for clinicians to to initiate assessments themselves as well is to give that that flexibility to if you're if you're seeing that as a pattern with a student, then you have the opportunity to give feedback on whichever client interaction you'd like. That being said, we are also um, believing that our students are adult learners that they're there to learn and want the most feedback, like relevant feedback that they can get. And so I think for the most part, we have students who are really keen to, to do that, but um, you do as a clinician also have an opportunity to do your own, trigger your own assessments as well. If it's something that you feel like you would like to give feedback on and they didn't ne necessarily initiate that, um, you have that ability, you'll have that ability as well.
Melanie also has a question about, will the case studies address different stages of life for each client? For example, a child with CP at each diagnosis, transitioning to equipment at school, and then to independent living in adulthood. To be honest, I was actually just looking at the pediatric cases, so perhaps I can talk a little bit about it. Um, so because of the way the pediatric cases have been de developed, or actually all the cases, we have release points for the case. So the students get a narrative part one, a part two, and a part three for each case. And for several of the um, pediatric cases, they have uh, changed the age of the child, so it's a progression. Uh, we've done the same thing for cystic fibrosis because there are some competencies related to transitions in care or working with like, a, um, like across the lifespan. So it may not be in every pediatric case um, that they would have this transition, but it is definitely there. And it's, it's not, it's kind of in other conditions as well. There may be, as I said, like in cystic fibrosis, we've taken a similar approach and there may be other conditions as well. Great. And Natalie wanted to know what the impetus was for this curriculum change. Did anyone like to? <laughs> Jordan, did you want to dive into that one first? <laughs> sure, sure. I think um, number number one, I think, was that we've had a huge turnover in faculty over the course of the last 10 years. And, and kind of the way we were approaching teaching and learning wasn't really mirroring the way our current faculty thought about teaching and learning. And so in particular, there was an identification of a need for more active and engaged and applied uh, approaches to teaching and learning versus uh, so so that um, was a stimulus to move away from kind of our two lectures in a lab format of teaching and learning. Um, and as we kind of went back back to some of the basics of of what it, how did we think about teaching and learning, it became very clear that having the abilities of our learners or, or the competencies of our learners as our targeted outcomes as opposed to knowledge or skills, for example, uh, um, um, was was something that was important. And so that led us to, um, to competency-based education as a, um, you know, as an approach to, to teaching and learning or a framework for, for our uh, new curriculum that really aligned um, with how we were thinking about things. Um, there were other elements um, such as the mapping process that we're required to do for our accreditation and, um, and how complex that was with our existing curriculum and having, having a, a very clear outcome framework that, that closely links to the competency profile um, will have lots of other benefits. But I would say, you know, a major driver was just, uh, you know, a, a desire amongst our group to, uh, to, to lead and to, to build in best practices in teaching and learning, um, and in particular learning from other health professions um, uh, around this transition to competency-based. So excited to be uh, what we think is the first competency-based education program anywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, so we're really excited to be kind of leading the way here for, for, uh, for the PT profession. And, and I suspect there'll be a, a, we might be the first domino in a, in a, in a kind of a, um, at least a, a national transition uh, potentially uh, beyond that. Thanks, Jordan. Do we know if OT is moving in this direction? Not currently, uh, is is uh, here at Queen's anyway. I don't know if there are, I don't have as, as quite as good as finger on the pulse of, of what's happening nationally uh, for OT programs, whether any other programs are considering this, but uh, um, not here at Queen's at this moment. But I think they're excited to learn how things go for us and uh, and who knows where that, uh, where that goes. Mm -hmm. We had a question about multidisciplinary opportunities in the new curriculum, are those built in or is it just gonna be hopefully that they occur on placements? Did you want to talk about IP email? Yeah, sure. So um, we've been working kind of at, at the faculty level and also at our, our school level on creating additional interprofessional um, activities that students are doing during their academic blocks. We recognize that a very organic way for that to happen is on their clinical placements. And there's lots of times where students from lots of different disciplines will be at a clinical site, which is a, really an incredible opportunity. But we do want to provide a foundation for those students before they go out to their clinical placements. And so, um, the Faculty of Health Science at large has put this as part of their strategic plan to integrate more opportunities for interprofessional or multidisciplinary practice into our curricula. Um, so there is a group 
that and the faculty of health sciences who have been working on doing that um, they've created a whole series of a lecture series that have have um, happened over and been delivered over the past couple of years now uh, and so i think that will be maintained Last year, in addition to what um, the, the larger faculty of health sciences was doing, uh, we also partnered with our OT colleagues and tried to find opportunities where there were good linkages in our curriculum um, to deliver some content together and also work on interprofessional competencies during those sessions. We're gonna be tweaking that a little bit this year um, and looking at new opportunities with a new curriculum of, of what those can look like and where they can happen. But we do have a course um, specifically called Professionalism, Collaboration, Leadership and Management. And so collaboration is one of the critical um, domains that are, are that live in that course. And so there will be lots of um, pieces that are related to that collaborative competency that happen specifically in that course in the new curriculum. Great. Any changes to our admission process? as a result of our curricular change. Ready to tackle that one? Uh, the, uh, we haven't made any changes specific related, specifically related to uh, the curriculum change. Uh, we feel like the, um, at, the expected attributes of our incoming students still apply here and that our existing uh, criteria that looks at GPA, sub-GPA, the CASPER um, uh, component that they apply to and the, and the information form um, that they, or the personal information that they uh, provide is still, still relevant uh, to that. Uh, but with that said, we have just made a, um, a small change to our admission process um, in, in hopes of uh, working towards our goal of, of um, recruiting or giving the opportunity for recruitment of a broader group or more diverse group of students. And, and that is to reduce our psychology uh, prerequisite uh, from a full year course to a half year course. Um, we had some concerns around uh, certain, whether students attend certain universities um, might have difficulty uh, meeting that requirement and therefore may uh, unintentionally narrow our applicant pool. Um, uh, to, to, to disadvantaging some students um, that may have difficulty meeting that uh, admissions requirement. So, um, so anyway, so so a change is coming, but it was actually unrelated to the curriculum change. <laughs> My uh, shorter answer. <laughs> Thanks, Bert. Uh, were there any other questions? Uh, yep, yeah, Brett, I can barely hear you. Oh, Try again. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Is this better? A little bit better, yes. Okay. I'm starting to get closer, apparently. Um, I was just looking through the um, essentially timing of the placements. And for me in particular, uh, because where I work is a catch all, I was just wondering if you, like, if we reached out um, for where we would have to offer our placements. Because currently, I know the way it currently works, I can offer placements in 883 and up. But the way this is looking, I might be able to offer some in 881. But then it would be difficult uh, seeing as what happens if they haven't covered a case of, of something that we see in the hospital. You know what I mean? Yeah, and Brett, it's a, it's a question I think we've had from a number of clinicians, but um, I guess the way we would look at the case is there are vehicles for students to learn and to demonstrate competencies. And although we are specifically talking about cases, there's no way any, any curriculum of any program, whether it's you know, medicine or, or PT, can cover every single case that you would imagine um, us seeing in our clinical practice. And so what we actually want is our students to be introduced to the um, to curricular content and be evaluated on competencies, not specific knowledge and skills about a particular condition or case. And to have those skills to be able to go and find information is probably more critical than the uh, you know being having receiving a lecture about a particular case, for example, or condition. And so our, our curriculum, although it does have a, a emphasis on case studies, they're really a vehicle for delivering content in all of the different areas of competence and giving our students tools so that they can apply those same principles 
to lots of different cases that they're going to encounter, whether it's something they specifically had content on um, in a particular case or not. And so, um, yeah, I don't want to, the, the list of cases to be misleading because in a way, although there's lots of comorbidities we're going to talk about within those cases and we'll, we will talk about some of the specifics of them, um, it's more that we're trying to emphasize competence and ability to translate that information regardless of what's thrown at the student. They can do that good clinical reasoning. They can go and seek and uh, like find information and apply that information regardless of, of the case in front of them. I don't know, Jordan or Sunita or anyone else, if you want to add to that though. I, I just add, I, I think that an excitement around um, increasing the readiness for a more um, for more uh, diff different uh, placements earlier in the program, where I think you know the the current curriculum is very musculoskeletal focused in the fall, and then there's been challenges to to you know with placement one and two uh, to to be able to to go out and um, you know and and learn and uh, placement one in particular and learn in in you know certain hospital based settings, for example. And I think this should we hope uh, provide a real opportunity where there's where there's greater readiness to to learn in uh, in any setting uh, uh, early in the program. So so just to add to the just reiterate that point. I think I'm I'm really excited to to see how that goes. But that's that's certainly the goal. Any other questions or? Uh, I have another question, if I could. Yeah. Um, in terms of labs, are they going to function the same kind of way? Are they going to be on a case-to-case -case basis? Or are, is the lab work, the actual hands-on stuff, going to change? I can start, and then I'll let others chime in. So um, the labs will also be based on the case that's being presented that week. So if we have a week that's focused on low back pain, then the classroom sessions would be focused around some theory related to that and the lab sessions would be focused around skills related to that particular area. Um, so as they progress through the curriculum, they'd be exposed to the different clinical skills that they would get through these different types of cases. Um, so yeah, they, when you think about it, how it may differ than currently, they may not get a whole big lump of MSK content in terms of lab skills in the same way that they're getting now. It may be spread over um, different weeks in different labs. So they may be coming to you on placement with a different um, skill set, but they will be doing clinical skills labs and they're thematically like based on the case of the week. And I'll let others uh, chime in with further clarifications. I think the one addition, like if we look at a snapshot of a week, uh, and you could speak to this probably better than me, uh, Sunita, as to what so, how some of these are taking shape, but is the simulation activities that we've got planned every week. And so there's three two-hour labs every week, which probably look you know, fairly similar to how existing labs are structured. Um, but then we've got a, a simulation a time booked every week for simulation, which will range from very low tech simulation uh, to to higher tech simulation. Um, but I wonder if you could just add a, add a component to that because that is a bit of a transition in the lab course. Yeah. So um, as Jordan was saying, we will have time for simulation for every week. So as we're developing those. Um, every Friday morning is booked for simulation. So in these sorts of lab sessions, the students will actually be role playing or they may have a volunteer patient coming in depending on the session, but they'll actually be role playing, playing as a clinician and um, as patient. So instead of just, you know, maybe an isolated skill that they may have practiced during that week, now they're going to be applying it. And again, the simulation scenario would be based on the condition that may have been presented that week. Uh, it may integrate information from previous weeks. So as we get like later in the curriculum, that simulation could be incorporating, you know, a wider range of information and getting students to draw together um, information over several weeks. So we are hoping that those simulation sessions will really help students bring to life what they will be then doing on clinical placement. Okay, thank you. Any other comments on that or questions? No? No, I was just going to note that there's another comment. Morgan, I think, who was asking me about um, how our curricular change might impact the ability for clinicians to offer 
multi-student um, supervision models. So having more than one student uh, with them. My opinion is I don't think that there will be a, a significant shift in terms of the ability to do that. I'm assuming you're you're thinking perhaps about the um, the change in assess the nature of assessments. Um, but I think that very similar to what you're doing now. Um, there's going to be observation of what students are doing on placement and evaluation of those and you'll you have a lot of autonomy and flexibility of when you complete and when students complete um, request those assessments to be completed throughout the, the seven weeks of placement and so I, I don't really actually see a, a big shift or a big change in terms of capacity to do that we always want to encourage clinicians to, to give that a try because there's lots of learning that can happen between students. Um, I know there's, uh, you know, we've definitely heard about some of the barriers to that as well, but I think that this is a, lots of new things are happening in healthcare and certainly in our program as well and um, certainly would help and support clinicians who are thinking about that model, but I don't think our new curriculum is going to really alter um, whether that feels feasible or less, fe more or less feasible. All right, any other questions or thoughts? We're not seeing any other questions. Um, just wanted to also welcome everybody um, and their colleagues to reach out to us if something bubbles up for you later that you didn't think of today in the moment or it was felt too complex to ask you or whatever the case may be feel free to reach out to any of us who are here on the call um, and we'll do our best to, to respond about the new curriculum. We have sent out our call for offers. So Rand, hopefully you saw that, a request for placements for our 2023-2024 academic year. And uh, so we did send some of this information as well along uh, with uh, that request. But if there's something you feel like you need to know a little bit more about before you're able to make some of those offers, by all means, at any point, feel free to reach out. And then we're hoping lots of you are also able to join us in those September and October sessions, um, where we're going to get into a little bit more of the actual mechanics and details of, of some of these, these um, things that we were just addressing today, particularly about the how to on, on those placement evaluations. But if there are no other questions, just want to again say a huge thank you for taking a little bit of your time today to join us. I know um, your time is valuable and we really appreciate you, you joining in and learning about our new curriculum and hopefully getting excited with us about this. I was just going to add, uh, Mel and I have been putting together a, a Q&A um, document that we'll post on our website as well that may help if other questions come available um, as they come up we're just adding to the document so that could be a resource as well that we can send people to anyway thank you again for your time and uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you uh, working with you again in the fall of course and have a great summer thanks everyone